Okay, are there any questions? If there's no questions, uh, I'm going to give you another minute for students to log in and then recording. All right, if there's no questions, I'm going to begin. Let's see, share the screen. I'm just going to continue where we left off in the lecture, and that was here, talking about passive transport and osmosis. So the movement against the concentration gradient is okay when the concentration of a substance required by a cell is higher outside the cell than inside the cell. But what is a cell going to do if it's living in the ocean or in the desert? The concentration of what the cell would want would be very low in the environment and much higher inside the cell. And in these cases, a cell has to use an active process and they use active transport. The movement of a material against its concentration gradient. The cell accumulates nutrients in those environments like the ocean or the desert against its concentration gradient. The movement of material against the concentration gradient requires the cell to spend energy. The cell needs to do extra work to move that molecule against its concentration gradient because it doesn't move that way. It normally would move the opposite way. Cells use active transport to pump the solute molecules against its concentration gradient. This requires a transport protein in the cell membrane. And these transport proteins are usually molecule specific, meaning they usually only move one molecule. And to move another molecule, you need a second transport protein. Uh, let me mention that in this slide, it's calling it a transporter protein. That is the same thing or means the same thing as a transport protein. Generally speaking, I'll use the term transport protein. And where were we? There we go. To move the molecule against its concentration gradient, the transport protein requires the use of energy and it gets that energy from one molecule of ATP. So for each molecule, the transport protein moves against its concentration gradient, it will spend one ATP molecule. Any questions about any of that? There is another way that cells can use active transport, and we don't call it that. We call it group translocation. This is a special form of active transport that is only found in prokaryotic cells. It does require a transport protein. It does require the use of energy, because it's moving a molecule against its concentration gradient. It does require a high energy phosphate compound, though, instead of ATP. And it's usually PEP that is used as the high energy phosphate compound. For example, glucose can move against its concentration gradient by group translocation through a transport protein. But the glucose is chemically altered when it's moving through that protein. A PEP transfers the phosphate to 
the molecule it's moving. In this case, we're saying glucose. This alteration helps prevent the escape from the cell of the molecule. It also makes the cells work a little easier. Let's say there are 10 glucose molecules outside the cell, and each glucose molecule is moving against its concentration gradient. To move the first one, you're now moving, I don't know, against your concentration gradient. And so it's not so bad. But then you move the second one, it's moving even further against its concentration gradient. And then you move the last one, the concentration gradient is 10 times higher than it was when you moved the first one, or close to that, okay? If, on the other hand, you move some of the glucose with active transport and then some of the glucose with group translocation, you're not going to be moving 10 glucose into the cell against its concentration gradient. Instead, you'll be only moving 5 glucose into the cell against its concentration gradient. And then you will be moving 5 glucose but they won't be against their concentration gradient because you're going to move them by group translocation. And so you'll be moving glucose into the cell, but the glucose will be changed into glucose 6-phosphate. And so the second one you move into the cell, there's only one glucose phosphate, but you're moving it against its concentration gradient. And so that makes it easier for the cell to move a molecule into the cell when it's using group translocation and group transport together. Does everybody see that? Instead of moving 10 molecules against its concentration gradient, you're only moving five. And it's true you're moving five two times, but it's easier for the cell to accumulate substances If you uh, reduce the number of glucose molecules in the cell, and when you use group, group translocation, it starts as glucose, but it'll end as glu glucose 6-phosphate. And so the cell will have 5 glucose moved into the cell and 6 glucose phosphates that were moved into the cell. Any question about any of that? Group translocation, remember, is only found in prokaryotic cells. It is not found in eukaryotic cells. All right, so that's it for the movement of material across the cell membrane. Let's go on and talk about the different structures that we can find in a cell. The cytoplasm is the majority of the inside of the cell of a prokaryotic cell. What it mostly is is water. The cytoplasm is about 80% water, but it does have dissolved solutes. One of those dissolved solutes actually is the DNA molecule, which wherever it's floating, we call it the nucleoid region. Inside the cytoplasm, you can find the ribosomes and the inclusions. These are, I don't know if I want to use the word particles, substances that are too large to go into solution. So the ribosome is too large to go in solution. Let me see if I can blow this up. And you can actually see the ribosome being the dots in the cell here and you can kind of make out the dots in the cell, in this cell, the actual uh, electron microscopic picture. Inclusions are things that the cell wants is in, and is accumulating inside the cell, and they accumulate to such numbers that they actually start precipitating out of solution. 
when they precipitate out of solution, we can then see them as a, I don't know, a round little figure inside the cell. And those we call inclusions. Any question about any of that? The nuclear area on a prokaryotic cell we call the nucleoid region. There's no distinction between the nucleoid region and the cytoplasm, meaning there's no boundary between the two. It's wherever the DNA molecule floats to. Any question about any of that? It's called the nuclear area or the nucleoid because when we stain the cell, it stains differently than the cytoplasm. But, as I stated, that DNA is in solution in the cytoplasm. So the nucleoid region can move wherever the DNA floats around. At least in a prokaryotic cell. Now, the ribosomes are very talked about, so let me just state that they are the site of protein synthesis in cells. The ribosomes can be free-floating in the cytoplasm, as shown here, or they can be uh, linked to a membrane. Now, in a prokaryotic cell, they would only be on the cell membrane. In a eukaryotic cell, though, they can be linked to the endoplasmic reticulum or to the nuclear membrane. The ribosomes I mentioned are the site of protein synthesis. They are made up of both ribosomal protein and ribosomal RNA. You don't need to know the sizes of the makeup of the ribosomes, but you should know that prokaryotic ribosomes are of size 70S and they are smaller than eukaryotic ribosomes of size 80s. Any question about that? There should be a question. What the heck does the S stand for? Is anyone going to ask? Sediment. Say again. Is it sediment? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, that's where the ribosome sediment in an ultra centrifuge gradient, meaning it's the molecular biologists and biochemists who came up with this method and they were measuring the ribosomes and they noticed that the prokaryotic ribosomes were sedimenting, sedimenting less down in the ultra centrifuge gradient than the eukaryotic ribosomes. And this is the region where they called it the 70S region, where a uh, prokaryotic ribosome will sediment in the ultracentrifuge gradient. And that's just the way they measured the ribosomes. I was more expecting somebody to just ask the question. I was really surprised somebody knew the answer. All right, we did mention about inclusions. These are reserve deposits that the cell brings into the cell and builds up in the cell. And the deposits get to be so big that they start precipitating out of solution. And when they precipitate out of solution, we can then view them under the microscope as an inclusion. They will be used by the cell when the resources are low. There are different examples of inclusions, but you do not need to know the names of them. Okay? Uh, here we're seeing inclusions in the, the magnetosomes. Uh, here is uh, sulfur granules. This must be a, a sulfur metabolizing bacteria. And it's incorporating so much sulfur in the cells that sulfur comes out of solution and then forms a, I don't know, a granule deposit inside the cytoplasm. 
And here we have the metal chromatic granules. Uh, I don't know if how well you can see that. The yellow marker is the division of the cell, and then the blue is the the uh, inclusions. Oops, wrong one. Go back. Go down. All right. The next structure I want to talk about is an endospore. An endospore is a survival structure that mainly two families of bacteria can produce, meaning all other families of bacteria cannot produce them. And uh, there's many more than two families of bacteria I don't know how many families of bacteria there are, but it's a large number. I'm sure it's over 20, okay? Uh, it might be as many as 100 or 200, I don't know. But there's a large number of families of bacteria, and mainly only two families can produce endospores. I think there might be a third family, and that's why I'm not saying only, I'm saying mainly. And uh, uh, the two families that mainly produce endospores are Bacillus and Clostridium. Okay, and I know there's a third family and I don't know what its name is. Uh, endospores are a survival structure. What happens is, is that when a parent cell, like this one here or that one there, is in an environment which is deteriorating. The parent cell knows that if the environment deteriorates further, the parent cell will die. And so the parent cell begins production of the endospore so that it can survive, or a portion of it can survive, whatever you want to call it. The endospore is not a reproductive structure. Only one endospore is made in one parent cell. And then the parent cell will die to release the endospore. So one cell makes one cell. That's not reproduction. The endospore is a survival structure, and the endospore is largely metabolically inactive. And the endospore is just waiting for the environment to change. And when it becomes favorable, the endospore will germinate, giving rise to a cell similar to the parent cell. We call the growing cells, or the parent cell, a vegetative state, or a vegetative cell. One that is metabolically active, it may be reproducing, and it's a cell without the endospore. To make the endospore, we call that sporu sporulation or sporogenesis, where the endospore is formed. And then when the endospore returns to the vegetative state, we call that germination. Any question about any of that? So here's a picture of bacteria, and uh, you can see that most of the cells here are making a white endospore. They're white under this staining. Uh, here we're probably looking at an electron microscopic image, and the endospore is this structure and that structure inside the parent cell here. We don't know how big the parent cell is, but it's right there. The endospore is usually smaller than the parent cell, and what the parent cell does when the environment is deteriorating, it will begin the formation of an endospore. What it does is the cell will divide its DNA so that part's normal. 
And then one part of the DNA will move to one side of the cell, the other DNA molecule will move to another side of the cell. What's different is the cell does not split evenly. It will split in a small portion which will come on and grow into the endospore and then the large portion which can be the uh, parent cell. And uh, this cell is showing that the endospore is forming on one side of the cell. Uh, I'll show you a little video where the endospore forms more in the middle of the cell, in which case there's a bit of a parent cell over here and a bit of a parent cell over here. Uh, the plasma membrane surrounds the DNA, and then we get a double membrane in the portion that's going to be the endospore. The uh, endospore then has peptidoglycan, oops, too far, peptidoglycan form between the double membrane, and then we get a spore coat forming on the outside of the cell. And you see this largely white area there? It's surrounded with something darker, but this region here is the spore coat formation. And then lastly, the parent cell will die, and that will release the endospore. Okay, any questions about endospore? If not, let's watch a little video on endospore formation. Uh, there it is. Let's get that out of the way. Come on. All right, the formation of an endospore. That wasn't what I was thinking. Right there. Not a little too far. Back up a little further. Come on. Well, maybe right there. And that is the endospore. That's not very much in the center, but uh, it is very much on the edge. But you can see that there is a little bit of the cell on both sides. I've got another picture someplace uh, showing you an endospore in the center of the cell. I thought it was this one, but it's not. Any questions about endospores? If not, uh, that brings us to the uh, eukaryote cell structure. And I think I'll stop here and begin the lab. See what we do on Tuesday. Yeah, we're going to cover chapter four and hopefully start chapter five. So we should be okay. All right, any question about what we're going to do? Um, today we're going to be covering lab five. And please read your unknown project instructions file. I will talk about the unknown project on Tuesday. It looks like we're going to have uh, the lab six on Thursday. Any question about any of that? <coughs> All right. If not, let's begin with lab five. That's the one I want. Okay. 
to make sure this is the one I want. Yep, that's it. All right. Let's shut a few things down here. All right. Actually, we can shut this down. So lab five, cultivation of bacteria, culture media, inoculation, and isolation. The learning objectives are be able to understand the importance of proper specimen collection and transport to the laboratory. Explain the five principal steps used by microbiologists to process a specimen coming to the lab and be able to differentiate between the various types of culture media. We're going to talk about that today and that's probably the main part of this lab. But also explain the purpose of a street plate culture technique aka uh, streaking for colony isolation and be able to define the following terms selective media, differential media, and reducing media. The ability to isolate a pathogen is only as good as the clinical specimen submitted for culture and that requires a good collection technique and then timely transport of the specimen to the lab. Some microbes are sensitive to desiccation, drying, or exposure to oxygen, and those would be anaerobes, and they require a special transport medium. Otherwise, the cells will die and you won't be able to culture them. Once a specimen is received in the laboratory for a microbioculture, microbiologists employ the five principal eye steps to process the specimen. First is inoculation, placing the specimen on an artificial culture media to initiate growth. Next comes isolation, spatially separating the microbial growth into distinct colonies. Then we have incubation, placing the culture medium in an environment that facilitates the growth of the culture. Uh, then we have inspection of the plate, examining the culture, culture for presence of microbial growth. And last we have, we, lastly, we have identification, and that will be performing specific tests to identify, identify any pathogenic microbes. Any question about any of these? You will actually be doing all of these in your unknown project later on in the term, but obviously we will be doing this all online. And so the inoculation, I'll just tell you to pretend you're streaking it out in the isolation, the same thing, you'll streak it out for colony isolation and, and take from one colony and streak it out for colony isolation a second time and then declare you've got a pure culture. And then you'll incubate it, which uh, that too is all done online. But you will expect, inspect it. I will give you the results and then you will have to inspect the culture for the presence of growth and get your test results and you use those results to identify the species. Any question about any of that? All right, so let's talk about the different types of culture media. You are already familiar with some different types of media and that is the general purpose media, uh, Na or nutrient auger a NE or nutrient auger with yeast extract, and TSA or triptych soy auger. Those are media that are fairly cheap to use. They grow many different types of bacteria. They don't grow all bacteria, 
but they're non-selective and we'll talk about what that is okay and they're just cheap and it's what we mostly use in microbiology the general purpose media however if you have a fastidious microbe this is one that requires specific nutritional requirements they will not grow on a general purpose media fastidious microbes have to grow on an enriched general purpose media and there are only two enriched general purpose medias that I recall that we're even going to talk about uh, one is blood auger where it is, I think it's triptych soy auger, supplemented with 5% sheep's red blood cells. And the blood is incorporated into the media to provide nutrients for the fastidious organism to grow. The second enriched general purpose media is chocolate auger, and it's actually the same as blood auger, it's just that the blood is added when the auger is very hot shortly after it came out of the autoclave and because the blood is added when the auger is hot it lyses the blood and that causes the appearance to be brown in the plate and that's why it's called chocolate auger in both cases the nutrients are supplied by the blood. In the chocolate auger, the blood cells are lysed and the bacteria can get the nutrients directly from the media. On the blood auger, the, uh, the organisms that grow on blood auger and won't grow on like triptych soy auger have to lyse the blood. And when you lyse the red blood cell, it will release nutrients for the microbe to grow. Any question about any of that? All right. Selective media is a media that contains chemicals that inhibit or halt the growth of some organisms. Other organisms can grow in that selective media. So some can grow, some cannot. You should realize two things when you're working with the selective media. First, the selection may not be perfect, meaning given enough time, an organism that is selected against can grow. And second, even those organisms that are supposed to grow in the selective media may grow smaller, meaning form smaller colonies, than they would on a media that is not selective. Any question about selective media? An example of a selective media is 7% sodium chloride. Only uh, cells that can grow and survive in 7% sodium chloride will grow on that plate. If they cannot grow in 7% sodium chloride, they will not grow on the plate. A differential media is a media that contains chemicals that produces differences among two different groups of cells. These differences may be unrelated to how well the organisms will grow on the media, but by looking at the plate you can see differences in different bacteria. They may have a different color. They may grow differently. Any question about any of that? All right, the last media we're going to talk about here is a reducing media. This is a organ, uh, media we use to grow anaerobic bacteria. The reducing media removes the oxygen from the media so the media will be without oxygen and even low oxygen could be enough to kill the anaerobic bacteria. All right, any question about any of that? 
It is important to note that the culture media can be classified into more than one category. For example, McConkie's auger is both selective and differential. And there's a number of media which are that way, more than one category. Any question about any of that? All right, McConkie's auger is selective, and that is it allows gram negatives to grow. So both of these species, this one over here and this one over here, are probably gram negative because it can grow on McConkie's. And the chemicals are uh, crystal violet and bile salts that prevent gram-positive organisms from growing. Uh, gram-negative organisms grow in the intestines where there is bile salts and the crystal violet gets stuck in the cell wall of the gram-positive cells and so they don't like growing with crystal violet. The gram-negative cell, because of its outer membrane, keeps the crystal violet away from the cell and they can grow in the McConkie's. So that's why it's selective. It's also differential in that it has the sugar uh, lactose. And if the bacteria can ferment the sugar lactose, it will be acidic and it has a pH indicator which turns pink, or you could call it purple pink, whatever, if it ferments the sugar uh, lactose. If it does not ferment the sugar lactose, it will not be pink, and it will normally be the same color as the uh, bacteria. In this case, it's off-white. Anyways, McConkie's is both selective and differential. Differential on the ability of the organism to ferment the sugar lactose, and selective in that uh, only gram negatives can grow on it. Blood auger is both an enriched media and a differential media. It is enriched from incorporating red blood cells in it, which is why it looks red from the blood. But it's differential because we can determine the hemolysis of different species of bacteria. Let me blow this up a little. So this bacteria, shown in white, we can see the blood is normal all the way up to the bacteria. This bacteria has gamma hemolysis, which is also called no hemolysis. This bacteria, we see a darkening around the cells, which are kind of off-white. And then inside the A there, the alpha, it is uh, also dark and that is from the partial lysis of the blood, making it look dark in this region or sometimes greenish looking. And that's from partial hemolysis and that's called alpha hemolysis. We also can see in the blood auger beta hemolysis, which is the complete lysis of the blood. And so the white beta here is the bacteria and around the bacteria we have a clear zone where all of the red blood cells were lysed. So here's the blood and there's no blood in this region and there's the bacteria. You'll notice that we have a dark ring around the beta hemolysis and what this dark ring is, alpha hemolysis, we normally see partial hemolysis around a region of complete hemolysis. Any question about blood auger? Both an enriched media, meaning it can grow uh, fastidious organisms, and it's also differential. We can differentiate three cells on their ability to hemolyze the blood. 
This table is showing you the different types of media, the general purpose media, and what they are, the different types of general purpose media. Uh, and then in a, the enriched media, and blood auger is in an enriched media as well as differential. Uh, cap is only an enriched media. McConkie's EMB and HE, or hectone auger, are all selective and differential. They are all selective in that they grow or allow the growth of gram negatives. And they're differential, all of them, on their ability to show lactose fermentation. The color of the lactose fermentation will be different than the organism growing on the plate, which does not ferment lactose, but each one of them has a different color if it ferments the sugar lactose. McConkie's, it's a pink color. Eocene methylene blue, it is a metallic dark color. It could be green or black. A hectone ag agar, if it ferments the uh, sugar lactose, it'll be uh, salmon colored. Uh, phenol ethyl alcohol, or P PEA, is a media that is only selective. And gram-positive bacteria can grow on PEA plates. <coughs> Another selective and differential media is mannitol salt auger. It is uh, selective in that only organisms that can grow on uh, a fairly high salt concentration, 7% sodium chloride, can grow on mannitol salt auger plates. If it can't grow on 7% sodium chloride, then it will be selected against the mannitol salt auger. A mannitol salt auger is also differential and that it allows you to determine whether the organism can ferment the sugar mannitol. If it ferments the sugar mannitol, it'll turn yellow. If it doesn't ferment the sugar mannitol, it will not be yellow. And mannitol salt auger is frequently used to separate Staphylococcus aureus from other Staphylococcus species because Staphylococcus can grow on mannitol salt auger as well as other halophiles, meaning other organisms that like salt. Uh, but Staphylococcus aureus will turn yellow and most other Staphylococcal species will not be yellow, meaning they do not ferment the sugar mannitol. All right, any questions about any of that? Incubation, showing you a plate. Isolation, uh, let's briefly talk about isolation. This was a concept developed by Louis Pasteur and he used it to obtain a pure culture. His method of obtaining a pure culture was very difficult to do and so uh, it was improved by Dr. Koch, who came up with the concept of getting a pure culture, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But Louis Pasteur developed the concept of isolating a species and then growing it up as a pure culture. And you need to have a pure culture before you can run a test and understand the test. Meaning, if you had a mixed culture growing on mannitol salt auger and it was yellow, does it mean that the species of interest can ferment the sugar mannitol? The answer is no, because you're not sure which species growing on the mannitol salt auger 
is fermenting the mannitol in a mixed culture. So to be able to answer that, you have to have a pure culture and grow it on the mannitol salt auger. Any questions about that? Oh, there it is there, I have it right here. A Robert Koch developed the street plate method where you put the bacteria on a solid plate and streak it over the plate to get isolated colonies. And when you do that two times, then pass the cells through two colony isolation events, you can call it a pure culture because in greater than 95% of the time, it will be a pure culture. Uh, when you streak uh, a plate, what you do is you get the loop, sterilize it, pick up the bacteria, and then streak it out in sector one. In sector one will have the most bacteria, and then you sterilize your loop and then streak it out in sector two, and it will have a lot of bacteria but less than sector one. And then the same thing with sector three, and then the same thing with sector four. And the goal of streaking it out this way is that someplace in one of the sectors, the bacteria will be diluted enough so that when you're streaking it, you will put down uh, a single cell or a very few cells which will give rise to an isolated colony. And to get a pure culture, you then take from this isolated pure colony and streak it out on another plate, getting another isolated colony. And then you grab from that isolated colony to start up your stock culture. Any questions about any of that? All right. So then you incubate the cultures, and that's put it in a specific environment appropriate for growing the microbes. You can control physical factors as well as uh, putting in so much oxygen and carbon dioxide, it can affect the temperature, the humidity, and obviously the time. Now most incubators, which is what we call it because we're incubating the cells, most incubators in a microbiology environment only warm the cells up to something like 35 or 37 degrees. And they may have a tray in there <clears throat> with water to provide some humidity. But other than that, most microbiology incubators don't do anything else. But some of them, like I said, you can regulate the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide and a few other, a few other things. You then grow up your culture, and that's usually after overnight incubation, but it could be two days of incubation, and then observe the cultures for colonies. And then you try and look at the colonies and make different um, concepts. Like if the colony looks different, it's probably different species. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. However, you usually at this part cannot do more than give colony characteristics. Like talk about the size of the colony, the shape of the colony, the color of the car colony, the margin of the colony, I'll talk about that in a minute, and the elevation. You usually would not be able to identify the species on inspection alone. To identify it, you then have to take a peer culture and run specific biochemical tests. Get the results of those tests and then use those tests to identify the species. Any question about any of that? All right, so know the terms of this lab. You don't need to look at the references. 
in this lab you should watch some videos. We have a video on inoculating an auger plate with the streak plate culture technique. You only have to watch the video to 4 minutes and 15 seconds. In this plate you should note that only three sectors are streaked instead of four. Then watch a little video on beta hemolysis, alpha hemolysis, and gamma hemolysis. And these happen on a blood auger plate. Watch a video on McConkie's auger. You only need to watch it to 3 minutes and 50 seconds. And then we have a little video on mannitol salt auger. Then practice preparing a street plate using a virtual lab. Let me make sure that you got that. I'm using an older version here, so... Nope, you don't need to do the virtual lab. Uh, the virtual lab requires Adobe Flash to run and Adobe stops supporting Flash and will have it turned off on your computer. The only way to run it is to download Adobe separately and then run it on your local computer uh, loading the, the lab on your computer and running it. And we decided it was too much trouble to do it that way. So you don't need to do the virtual lab. And then answer the questions. Don't answer it in the lab module. Answer the questions in the worksheet. Type up your answers. And then submit this by Saturday. 11.59 p.m. is when it will be due. And, uh, and that's it. Any questions about the lab? see if I have any more things to talk about. Do the videos answer some of those first few questions about like, hypothetical bacteria or environments? Yeah. For all of the questions, you can get the information from the lab module or from the videos in the lab module. Thank you. Okay. Occasionally, especially later on in the lab, there will be some questions which you'll have to look at an earlier lab module to answer the question. But at least initially, all of the questions will deal with the current lab module. It's not until later in the term that we will ask you a question and you'll have to look it up in an earlier lab module. I think we warn you about that. All right, go ahead and work on the questions. I will be here until the time the lab ends to answer any questions if you get stuck. Okay, um, I'm trying to tell you. Oh, there it is how late I'll be here, and uh, <laughs> you would think I would know that I'm an absent-minded professor and I do not remember. I will be here until 8.20, so you have almost an hour. All right, work on the lab. I'm going to stop recording.